you, you don't get to have that often. You're just always like shows are canceled and this and that. So yeah. you don't get to have that kind of brevity and, and beauty of what like the commitment to, to just being a human being in the world is. What kind of advice has everyone had for Ian and Harry about working on the show? I, I feel like certainly that it, that it was going to be rigorous, that it was that it's that it's hard. I think this show is really really challenging, but really rewarding, uh, just because we're such a rewrite machine. So it's just so atypical that like no one's ever receiving a script and that's final. Like we're, we we're doing tweaks to mixes, which is like unheard of. We're we're rewriting all the time just to try to give you guys the best version of the show. So it was just keeping them open-minded and, and prepared for that from day one, that like, this is a constantly evolving thing. It's what makes episodes feel complex and crazy, you know? Because they, they just become like croissant dough, just layered stacks of delicious, deliciousness. I'm hungry. Can you tell I haven't eaten breakfast? You know, it mostly is just about keeping your vocal uh, range okay. Like I got really sick this year. It was the first time I think that I ever really struggled vocally. Um, I'm okay now, but it like it took me like two months to kind of get back to my regular voice. And you know, you're like you're aging. You gotta just be constantly, you know, lubricated. Your voice has to be lube. Like it's. Uh, you know, I live with an air humidifier. Like, I can't go outside. I feel like it's too dry in California. You know, there's like, I mean, I've had some pretty t intense episodes, but making sure that like, I'm just ready to go whenever they need it. Um, but I love that we have constant rewrites. It keeps it really like, it, it feels like they, they care. You know, it feels like there's definitely a lot of pressure in a, in a good way to make the show the best that it can be. And so I... I kind of love going through the challenge of it and experiencing it in all different iterations because I feel like it's really incredibly collaborative. The beautiful thing about animation, right? You you write a story and then you have animators, you have background art, like artists who do the backgrounds and you have the voice actors and you have like constant tweaking throughout that and it's not, and the music and everything that, and your sound design, it's not just one thing. You're, you're an, rarely stuck with what you have. It's not like shooting a multi and it's yeah. like, well, we got what we got. It's like, no, we, if we yeah. have the time and the ability, we can keep perfecting. Yeah, so, and usually I think it ends up being better than what it was before. I always feel that way. Yeah. yeah. And can I just say, Spencer, you know, you and the established cast and everybody on that team that you just mentioned in all facets of the show really set the bar high for us to want to come in and, and want to work up to that. And so uh, I don't know that there's a, a, a distinct kernel of wisdom, you know, or, you know, that was given as advice. But the environment that we are privileged to step into and work with is um, is is one with high standards. And that's uh, that's a dream. It's it's nice to see Ian and Harry taking care of their voice, because when I when I I had inherited the show uh Royland had not been and uh Rick and Morty uh individually are really taxing on both sides of the spectrum hitting hitting Morty's just higher pitch and just Rick's general gravel are challenging on both sides of the vocal cords now, Ian it seems like it was a pretty quick turnaround from when you were officially cast to when you started what did you discover <laughs> about what did you discover about you your character to, that's what they told you <laughs> oh okay all right. Well, still, what did you discover about the character as you got deeper into recording the season? So much. Um, I've been a fan of the show for all of its 10 years leading up to this. And so um, I feel in some ways I'd I'd grown with the with the characters as a fan. And then to be able to step into the role and look at these episodes, look at the scripts differently from the inside. Um, again, a privilege and really cool to um, to be part of that journey and, and helping shape the direction where Rick, Rick will go. What I discovered about the show in general and the process in general is what a supportive environment it is um, from the top down. Um, absolutely felt as if the team, Martyr, had my back, uh, you know, both vocal care wise and just in the in the big picture sense of wanting to deliver the best season seven we could. So I appreciated that as a fan. And then about the character, I, I think that there's, there's some really interesting emotional layers that we're exploring with Rick, both in this season and hopefully beyond. And as an actor, that's compelling to uh, not get locked into an idea of the character, but really um, see see him as, as a human being and for all his God tier status, his vulnerability as well.
Well, speaking of, you know, Rick's journey, this season saw him defeat the nemesis that defined his entire purpose in life. Now that prime Rick is gone and the, the main Rick is sort of rudderless, what does this mean for Rick, the Smith family, and the show moving forward? I, f for us, 705 did a lot of cool things in that it, it surprised people by closing one door, but we felt like it kicked one door even wider open, which was Evil Morty, by leveling him up and giving him the Omega device and keeping him out there as just this sort of like open threat because like he's ultimately like such an integral part of the show's fabric that we felt like it's cool that we had this new bad guy that could kind of tee him up in an even bigger way and keep everyone's focus so like while rick's still coming to terms with this revenge this personal revenge story being done there's still more to do out there so there's it gave us a lot to wrestle with this was a very silly season in the best way were there any really absurd lines of dialogue or even whole scenes that were especially difficult to get through in the booth? There were some challenges in 705 just with the vocal demands. Uh, and, and again, with vocal health in mind, um, I felt pushed in the best way possible to um, to, to find those uh, extreme parts of Rick and also keep it grounded in, in the emotional truth of that of those scenes. I, I will come back to 705 as one of the most interesting ones to work on as an actor. They're all interesting, uh, but 705 certainly has a full range of Ricks and with the support of everybody in the room, I was able to really uh, push to the limits a little bit and, and have fun. You know, I think for me, the Quattro episode was my biggest episode. So I think I really liked, uh, I had some good one-liners, you know, like Ariva dead cheap bitch, like just some stupid, <laughs> like, or, you know, the like go, go ponytail, like Rick is, I think I did like 20 different versions. Like we had a whole bunch of them. So I was, uh, it, that was just fun for me as a character and always makes me laugh. I mean, I, I love recording. So I think they just build in an extra like half hour every time. So I could just chat about stuff. Cause I'm like, Hey guys, well, what's going on today? <laughs> um, it's, it's my favorite and it takes me about like five minutes to warm up. So I usually go back to the beginning of the episode. Um, when I'm like, kind of like, almost finished with it sometimes <laughs> rolling yeah yeah when i'm like rolling in summer i'm like really immersed in summer after that because uh you know being a teenage rebellious girl looking for love is is always it's a little far away for me it's, it's not that far away <laughs> just i pretend like it is <laughs> what was everyone's personal favorite moment from this season i mean i'll tell I'll, I'll tell you like I, I i particularly like love the alley scene in the finale because i feel like it's a scene that we rarely give people which is like just a really raw vulnerable one that people wouldn't expect it's not like it's not one that's going for comedy it's one that's like diane's a character that we've really you know like she's a really big deal in the nucleus of this show and we've rarely seen her on screen so it was important to us to show a character that we felt like could hold her own with Rick. Uh, so that was just a cool moment where like, look at these two, they can drink shoulder to shoulder. She enjoys his f***ed up jokes. They're, you know, she's a little crazier than he is maybe. Like that was a neat one for me. I'm I'm also just, Spaghetti Planet is one that I'm just in general proud of because that idea is so beyond f***ed up that like for me, when, when you like, when you stumble across one of those and you feel like only your show can do it, I feel like you gotta pursue it hard because it's like if we don't do it no one can and uh i'm glad it didn't get us canceled i'm glad people love it i know it. i want to know what salisbury steak is now uh, just, yeah we know. never talked about that too in depth uh it ain't <laughs> salisbury steak i don't want to know <laughs> i i grew up with uh with, with spaghetti thursdays at my grandfather's that's a real thing in my life so when i read that in the script uh i was delighted and horrified um <laughs> so that's uh, yeah uh but uh, i i would i would echo you martyr i, I would say the tenderness of rick in 710 that we see and there are glimpses in the Quato episode, not that Summer needs this validation from Grandpa, but where Rick recognizes and acknowledges the presence of Diane and his grandkids. That is a sweet moment when he starts to see that in his family. I think it says a lot about those family dynamics and relationships. When you're doing a comedy, anything that's a half hour series, I think you're, you're always like finding jokes, throwing them in there, keeping your audience connected and there was a lot of breath in these episodes this season that I felt allowed us. Uh, it just felt like a different rhythm than I had seen previously. Of, and it was really interesting to watch. It almost was like we've been watching the show mature and grow as the seasons have been growing. Characters are evolving. 
Yeah, and it was beautiful. I mean, I, I just was like, wow. I mean, the, I mean, there's there's endless places you can go, but in in the 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 lifetime of a show, when you get the opportunity to play characters for so long, or you get to build stories for so long, it's like, well, what's next? How do you top the season before? And like, essentially, it almost feels like a reflection of a human life that we're witnessing. Like the growth of the show is equally that of of a, of a person in a way. So. There's something really, I don't know, like you, you don't get to have that often. You're just always like shows are canceled and this and that. So yeah. you don't get to have that kind of brevity and, and beauty of what like the commitment to to just being a human being in the world is, the way the show is doing it I, for its audience, you know, I guess. We're, I'm very grateful. We're very lucky to, to have a 10 season pickup and get the plan for an arc is a yeah. unique TV situation. But we're like trying to live up to that. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And Ian, uh, don't let my last name fool you. My mother's family's from the North End, so I had very similar growing up with... Oh, uh, what is it? Was it Mike, Mike's in Modern. What's your pastry? It's a, what am I ordering? Oh, all right. <laughs> Good answer. Look at that. <laughs> you guys literally like turn that. into different people. <laughs> yeah, Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much.